C'est parti, concentration. Elle joue gros. Émilie, c'est maintenant. Ça va. C'est fini C'est terminé, bravo Marie Pierre, c'est la gagnée, elle l'a mérité. Il va falloir y aller, elle y va peut-être Et c'est elle qui manque Le 23 e but français Oh, hello everybody Hello Barbara, hello Kobe Welcome hello. to... Women in Sport podcast in English, but uh, bienvenue sur Femmes et Sport podcast. Uh, we are here with Kobe. So Kobe, before we start, I would like to introduce you. You are a physiotherapist who graduated from Curtin University in Perth, in Australia. Uh, you are reaching a thesis in physiotherapy on fear of re-injury uh, in people with ACL injury under the supervision uh, of Merv Travis, who gave me your contact, by the way. Thank you, Merv, if you listen um, to us, sorry. Uh, and you have initiated a great event. You will tell us more about uh, in this podcast. Uh, did I forget something? Would you like to add something else about, about you? Oh, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm super excited to be on this podcast. It's, it's such an amazing um, idea and I love, I love what, you, what you guys stand for. Um, no, I think you've covered everything. Yep. Physio, doing a PhD in ACL injuries, looking into fear of re-injury. Yep. That's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Perfect. So what is your, your aspect with female condition? Because when we, we have a, a podcast about female athletes and sport female, so what is your link uh, with that? Um, I mean, over my career, I've worked as a physio, um, for Cirque du Soleil. So um, I don't know if your experience with that company, but it's a circus company that tours the world. So I... Okay. Um, toured... Yeah, Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I toured with them for a few years, going over Japan, Asia, bits of Europe and Australia um, and got a really good understanding of um, what it's like for or to manage, I guess, female athletes working in a really elite level. Um, so that was my professional experience. Um, I mean, my personal experience, I, I tend to dabble a bit in various different sports. So yeah. um, triathlon is, is probably where I spend my most time because it's a super time-consuming sport and doesn't leave much room okay. for other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. Um, Uh, so Ironman, I, I do a little bit of like half Ironman sort of um, mm. competition. And being in Australia, we have a, a lot of really nice open water swims. Um, so, yeah, I've just done uh, competed in a team doing a 20-kilometer open water swim, which is cool. So those are, <laughs> those are, my, <laughs> those are my sort of interests personally. Um, I, and that's it. <laughs> so you are a female athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, awesome. And uh, with um, and you make a PhD after becoming a professional physiotherapist. You come back to academics, if yep. I understand yeah. well. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I'd been, um, yeah, I'd been touring. Um, the world with Cirque du Soleil and I'd been with the company for a few years and mm -hmm. it was, yeah, around that time I thought actually what I want to do now is I just want to do a pivot and um, get involved in some research because, yeah, during that time where I was with the company, um, it was a really good opportunity to reach out to lots of researchers in the sports medicine field and they were very generous with their time because, um I think it's cool for them to see their research applied to such high level athletes. So I might send them a video mm. of an acrobat doing something crazy with knee pain and be like, Hey, this is what they need to do. <laughs> and you, um, me. <laughs> I know it's your, yeah, tell me, like you're the, you're the guru in this area. Um, most people we would only read like normal people would rehab them up to like, you know, being able to run, squat, jump, maybe yeah. not touch their feet to their head or, Um, do something ridiculous. So, so yeah, um, 
I guess it was during during that time I got exposed to a lot of really amazing researchers and and I also you know just by virtue of traveling a lot um saw a lot of really Mm. cool conferences where I was like oh wow people are doing amazing things around the world and I guess it was just being exposed to that that made me think oh this is something that's possible for me to do whereas before I just really you know you you um what's the saying you um (sighs) you need to see what you can believe or something along those lines. Like, Mm -hmm. so yeah, seeing, I guess seeing other, I I think other female researchers that were sort of quite young doing amazing Mm -hmm. things really inspired me to do it. Like people like Ebony Rio, um, like Sarah Dern, like, you know, um, and Tasha Stanton, like involved in a lot of that pain research that was really cool for me to see. And I was like, okay, well, at one point they were me, like they were a physio <laughs> and now, you know, they're doing yeah. something that I'd like to do. So, yeah, I, I think that sort of made me pivot a bit and go, okay, well, all right, I'm going to get into research. Um, it's nothing I ever envisioned I would do when I was studying physio because I thought research was quite boring. But then seeing like how it can be applied and like, <laughs> you know, it's something that I think can really like your passion can really be funneled into research is something that's really cool. Um, so yeah, I, um, th- th- there was a long time between deciding to do a PhD and actually figuring out how to make that a possibility. Like that was a long time. Um, so, you know, how to how get a scholarship. Who to, yeah. Oh, it would have been, I think it would have been five years. Okay. So yeah. Oh, so it was five impressive. years and it was a, like a, it was a real journey going from um, I did an internship in Norway um, at the Public yeah. Health Institute mm-hmm. and um, at Jeez. the time I was, yeah, I was like, oh, hey, look, this is what I want to do. I want to do a, a PhD. Um, I really like, you know, the kind of research that your group does. So they do a lot of um, big epidemiological research in Norway. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They also pay their PhD students really well, which is <laughs> isn't like a <laughs> – <laughs> which is more different than in France and yes <laughs> yeah. more than in yeah, France exactly. and in Australia <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly so Scandinavia being amazing like pay their researchers really well so I was like this could this could be good so um and you'll love this um so the area that we were looking into was um how um sex hormones um impact chronic pain so we developed a, a research plan um requested funding for it got the funding for it to be a phd position and then had to advertise it because it's a government position um and everyone at the um public health institute is like oh congratulations you've got this phd position this is going to be cool and i was like oh amazing um just have to interview because it's a government role we're just going to advertise it for a week um and then they had like hundreds of people apply um long story short (laughs) long story short I didn't get that position because like someone super qualified got it and I had no research to my name at that point so like that wasn't meant to be um okay and then yeah ended up at Curtin um speaking to one of my supervisors from my master's um research my Mm. master's um course physio course um and he was super supportive um We had done a little bit of research in ACL injuries and I just was talking to him about, you know, there's a real gap between like the pain science and sports science, I think. Like Mm. pain science seems to really um, get the idea of treating people as a whole person and the many factors that can contribute to pain, whereas sports injuries is so focused on you know really minute details Mm -hmm. of well if we do 10 reps then maybe they'll that will reduce their risk of hamstring strains whereas maybe Mm -hmm. if we hold it for 30 seconds that like it was all very like singular single factors if that made sense so I was like I was I was really keen to sort of bridge those those two fields um so that's kind of how I ended up um going down this path of investigating um fear of re-injury with people with ACL injuries like adding that sort of psychosocial aspect of it. Mm. Which is super new yeah, in uh, ACL injury. It's, uh, I never heard something like that before. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, I've just done a scoping review as one of my first studies for my PhD. 
and looking at the publication dates of the studies. So there's 141 studies in my scoping review and the majority of them came out in the last five years. Okay. So it's just it's just exploded in the last five years because I think it's, um, you know, improvements in surgical techniques have taken us quite far um, and then improvements in rehab have taken us pretty far. But that's that's all pretty, you know, stagnant at this point in time and we're still seeing people not returning to sport at, you know, at very low rates. So like 50% of people or something along those lines will return to their pre-injury level of sport after an ACL injury. So the, yeah, they're basically fear of re-injury or psychological factors were the most cited reason for not for them not returning to sport, um, which is why, yeah, mm. we're, we're looking into that a bit further to, to figure out, okay, well, what's going on there? What are people, um, how can we modify this? Um, mm. So my original, my big idea was, okay, well, great, let's, let's do a study looking at how we can modify fear in people with ACL injuries, like, I don't know, let's look at graded exposure, try and, try and you know, do some of the um, interventions that we would do for people with back pain, like fear-related, um, fear of movement related to pain for people with ACL injuries. And then mm. um, when we looked into the data a bit more, it's not really a pain problem. So a lot of people with mm. ACL injuries, they're, you know, they have um, full function, they've got very little pain at the end stage of their rehab, um, They've had good outcomes with surgery, but it's psychological. So, um, yeah, we what's had happened? to really step back and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's happened? <laughs> Everything is good. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, just maybe for our um, auditors. Non-physio um, auditors one. <laughs> Non-physio <laughs> auditors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, could you define uh, ACL injury? Uh, are you searching about after surgery only or maybe in patients who did not have surgery actually yeah no i know definitely yeah no we the my study did look at um either injury or post surgery um mm. um but most of the studies don't compare so like mm -hmm. they don't compare post injury versus post reconstruction so I don't have any, any good information to tell you at this point about that. Um, yeah. I think there's been some really recent research um, from La Trobe Uni that's looking at a way to facilitate healing of the ACL. Um, so instead of, instead of going down a path of, all right, someone injures their knee, let's give them a chance to see if they'll cope okay without surgery. Um, and if they can't, then we'll do surgery. So that that's sort of been how things have been going in the last, I don't know, five or so years. Um, another option has come into play very, very recently where they look at um, bracing someone's knee in, the, in 90 degrees to bring the edges of the ACL together. They'll do that for 12 weeks, do another MRI and see if there, there's healing of the ACL and then continue on with rehab um, as per usual usual ACL rehab protocols. Um, but my understanding with that is this is super early early stage. Um, they had really good results, like 90% of, of people had ACL healing, um, which is I was surprised by those results. Um, and that was out of I think it was like 232 people. So they're looking to do an RCT in that space now. So But yeah, I think they had quite good um, psychological, like patient reported outcomes after those, um, that option um, and that pathway, I should say. But it's too early to say whether that's going to impact return to sport and long term fear of re injury. So yeah, but I mean, when we're looking, when I'm looking at the data, like the qualitative data around fear of re injury, a lot of the people who are discussing their, um, Yeah, their their concerns. They don't. Yeah, one of the fears is I don't want to go through surgery again. I don't want to be put in a brace again. I don't want to have to do the mm -hmm. rehab again. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one factor. So in in the I um, confirm. the range of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I had an um, an ACL injury. Uh, there wasn't um, a rupture. A tear. Yeah. Um, a rupture is a break. And a yeah. tear could be 
like a little like half of it or a third or okay yeah i added uh, a tear okay yeah uh twice <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> <the> same me <laughs> while I, I was dancing, and I have been in rehab um, for two years. Whoa! It was very very long, and uh, I mm. didn't have surgery, but I stopped dancing. I was afraid. <laughs> I was really afraid because it was um, I caught my leg next to my head, and my my knee on the floor um just uh, oh wow yeah okay. that's very don't don't look super good <laughs> the <idea laughs> no. of, the, of this no, my knee was 90 degree 90 degrees but on the other side on the so other side oh i'm yeah. sorry to hear that yeah. but uh i'm fine now mm, but i think that i i didn't um start again dancing um because of that so you yeah you you a common typical... story isn't it yes uh, yeah. in the in your topics <laughs> you have a cobai uh when you when you talk about acl injury uh which kind of acl injury do you take in your study it's the people who are full broke or it's only tears how, how do you choose it's a it's a questionnaire an index or something people What, what describe, like, how, how can you describe the people who are involved in your thesis? Um, do you mean the patients, the participants? Yeah. 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 Which, um, which kind? Well, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not too strict on who I would take, to be honest. I would take anyone with an, a tear um okay. or a full rupture or yeah so okay um because where yeah where my thesis is going to go is i'm at this i'm at the early stage now where i'm trying to figure out what this whole construct is so you know what wh how are people in the literature defining fear of re-injury um mm. how are they measuring it and then yeah. yeah and then um looking to develop a measurement tool myself Because what we found was the definition that's been used, well, most of the studies, like 83% of them, haven't provided a definition for fear of re-injury. So we don't really know what what this psychological construct is that people are yeah. sort of experiencing. Um, so what is the fear informed by, if that makes sense? Um, and then of the ones that do give a definition, um, they give a definition around kinesiophobia, which was a, a definition that's, related to back pain so kinesiophobia is fear oh sorry can you can you explain <laughs> what is kinesiophobia phobia, please yeah yeah so kinesia, oh, sorry kinesiophobia is fear of movement um related to pain so mm -hmm. it's a sense of vulnerability in whatever body part you have that might be painful um, and mm -hmm. you're afraid to move it because you're afraid that there will be pain that results from that so that was a definition created 30 years ago for people with chronic back pain um which i think is a pretty good description of people with chronic back pain but it doesn't seem to fit people with acl injuries at the end stage of their rehab where they're you know pain's not really a dominant they don't it's not the physical sensations that are dominant it's this it's mm. still a psychological sense of vulnerability in the in the knee but it doesn't seem to be related to pain so the mm. definition that's being used isn't really accurate And then the measurement tools that are being used to measure it were designed to measure kinesiophobia. So the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia is a questionnaire that's, again, developed for people with chronic pain. And the questions are related to pain, like I'm afraid to, um, I don't know, I'm afraid to do this yeah. movement because I won't be able to control my pain or my pain will get too bad or something like that. Whereas those questions don't really fit for people with ACL mm -hmm. injuries. So the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia has been used in like, you know, um, I think it's like 60% of studies that measure fear of re-injury and ACL injuries and it just doesn't really yeah. seem to fit. So, yeah, so I've just finished looking at all the qualitative research around this, so what patients are actually saying they're fearful of and it's so broad and, you know, it's much broader than pain. It's like I'm afraid of 
you know, like we've said, I'm afraid of going through surgery again. I'm afraid mm. that, you know, I won't be able to work. I won't be able to provide income for my family, that I'll have to be dependent on my family and, you know, social relationships will be strained. I'm afraid to not play sport and, um, you know, miss out on seeing my friends. Um, they get this loss of sense of identity because maybe the sport that they were doing that mm. they had the injury in the first place, um, like I don't know if this fits with you, Barbara, but with dancing, um, yeah, and once you injure yourself, if you've put in so much time to dancing and then you injure yourself and then you can't do the dancing where well, you've made a whole social circle around that, you've probably got this sense of, you know, I'm a dancer and if I'm not dancing, then what am I? Um, because, yeah, so, <laughs> so there's... That, yeah, that seems it was to be very like complicated, a, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the next year, yeah, I began to study very hard to to enter a speech therapy school. So I I didn't have the time to to train and to dance. So my injury was the the first step and then I I just had to let go uh with dancing. Although it was a, a patient for me, so yeah, it was complicated yeah 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 definitely so it becomes it's more than fear of yeah re-injury or yeah fear of pain like there's so much tied into it yeah so many things inside the uh, SEL <laughs> and do you think yeah. it's um I don't know if it's an English word but I I try to do it with English accent and we'll see uh is it <laughs> oppression Like uh, you, you apprehension. I don't know how to say in English. Maybe like you, you become super careful Pressure. about what you do with oh, your yes. knee. Oh yes, yeah, apprehension. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it's something like that? The fear of reentry? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's you not you won't you'll hold back from things. Um, you won't go in as hard as what you normally would. So if you do return to sport, yeah, you're constantly, you're much more aware of your surroundings. Like, is that person over there going to come and run at me or um, much more hypervigilant mm -hmm. to what's going on around them and mm -hmm. other possible causes of injury? Like, oh, I don't want to play on this ground because this, this particular ground looks like it might have potholes, like holes in it or um, not, you know, I don't feel confident in my knee. So I don't think I want to play at night or, you know, it's raining today, mm. so the ground might be slippery. So, yeah, there's lots of different... They become a lot more yeah, cautious. Yeah, it looks like yeah. uh, post-traumatic. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, syndrome post-traumatic, like uh, hypervigilance and think a lot about it. Uh, how can you mm. can you be safe? It's super interesting. Uh, we, uh, what do you... When do you finish your study? <laughs> um oh good question um <laughs> yeah hopefully hopefully in a couple of years time so okay. 20 have to wait to 2025 yeah okay. um yeah hopefully this study will be done in the next couple of months okay um, cool. <laughs> can't wait to yeah. read it it's super interesting <laughs> and is there any dif difference between uh, men and women in that fear Yeah, actually, um, there's there's only been one study that's looked at the differences between genders in relation to fear mm -hmm. or like the psychological experience of an ACL injury. Um, and yeah, men, like both genders will have fear of re-injury, but men will tend to be more afraid of sport-specific um, sort of stimulus. Like if they, in say if they injured their knee playing soccer or football, And it's like a they're running and they change direction quickly or they jump and land. They'll be afraid of those specific sport-related movements, whereas um, women will tend to be afraid of things more broadly. So it might be um, they, they lack confidence in their knee after the ACL injury. So it becomes, oh, I don't know if it's safe to run anymore or maybe I like that they limit their physical activity in general as opposed to just that specific sport where the injury occurred. So, again, that's just one study, but it showed some very interesting sort of differences between genders. Is there any difference between the, the injury, uh, in ACL injury, between women and men? 
Um, yeah, so the risk of injury, ACL injury, is much higher in women. So it's about three to six times higher in women than in men. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that gap, you know, that gap between men and women hasn't really changed in the last 20 years. Um, okay. And there's a lot, there's a lot, I have to say about that. <laughs> um, and as the menstrual cycle, an impact on injury risk? Yeah, so that that has hormonal, the hormonal aspect has been one um, aspect that has been considered as, as in, like increasing the injury risk. So um, there's, there's actually not a good understanding of this. Um, and there needs to be a lot more research in this. So the general consensus is we don't really, there's a lot of risk factors that are different between men and women and the historic narrative around it has been around we've got differences in anatomy, um, hormones are a factor and there's biomechanical factors that are involved that are causing differences. Um, so there's, I think there's weak evidence that estrogen can um increase the risk of like high high when you're in your high phase of estrogen in your menstrual cycle it can that's a time when it can increase your injury risk i don't think that's been tested that well i think it's a pretty weak evidence and um to be honest it's it i find it creates a bit of a story around fragility of female athletes and that kind of fits with a lot of other sporting injuries with female athletes as well um and You know, if you actually look at in people with ACL injuries, so you know, we know that women have a much higher risk of ACL injury. We know that things like the ground that you play on, the footwear that you're using, your um, your the resources that you receive as an athlete. So, say the the expertise in coaching, um, the medical staff involvement. Um, you know, how experienced the medical staff is and the med- and the coaching staff, um, the long-term development that the athlete has received for biomechanics, all of that plays a huge impact in their, in their risk. And um, so, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think there are many social factors that play a, a role in female athletes developing ACL injuries at a higher risk than men. And I think to say that it boils down to, oh, we have estrogen and, um, you know, we've got a higher Q angle and um, there's some other biomechanical factors that make us fra- make women fragile to um, or susceptible to ACL injuries is not a helpful narrative. Um, I think if we look at the social mm-hmm. constructs that are, actually are modifiable, um, I think that would be much more helpful. So, you know, like, for example, if we look at Australian Um, we have Australian football, which is a weird game for <laughs> any foreign people to see. Um, we have an oval ball and, yeah, it, we bounce it and it doesn't really bounce probably because it's an oval ball. And Anyway, it's just it's a weird game, but we love it in Australia. And it's only been the last, I don't know, say 10 years that women were actually allowed to play it. So I never played it growing up because I wasn't allowed to play it, right? Um, but in the last in the last 10 years, it's, well, especially in the last five years, it's It's um, really developed and we've got now a professional league of females that are playing and they've had a huge rate of um, injury, ACL injuries over the last couple of years. And the debate in the media has been around, well, a female's too fragile to be playing this sport. And, well, actually, they're actually working full time <laughs> and they're tired and then they're coming to training, training as much as the men. They're also training on really poor grounds compared to the men. So the, mm. the training ground that they're playing on plays it makes a that's a huge injury risk for ACLs. Like everyone knows that. Um, and then so that's a completely modifiable risk factor right there. The the equipment that they're using, like the, the uniforms, the footwear, that's all designed for men. Um, we know that there's a huge mm. injury risk for footwear with ACL injuries. Like the traction, the surface traction that you're creating with the footwear and the ground surface that you're playing on is an injury risk. So if it's not designed to the body that it's being worn for, then, you know, that that's just <laughs> silly to me. Um, and then we know that there's huge, there's much more money for, um, you know, coaching staff and for healthcare professionals in male sport. So the most experienced um, professionals will be going to male sport. Women will lack the 
the development, the long term development that they that the male counterparts are receiving. So there's a lot loaded into, you know, this injury risk. Um, a lot more than women are anatomically or biomechanically too fragile to be playing sport. So yeah, yeah you found my you found my my button. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's super <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and according to you, is there any big psychological or social factor uh, that can explain a big part of the variance uh, in injury risk, ACL injury risk? Yeah, I would say um, I don't. I don't know of any psychological risk factors that would explain the variance in, in ACO injuries between male and females. Um, but socially, um, it seems like we know that preventative programs for ACL injuries are effective and prevention programs look like strength training, plyometric training. Um, and there is a social aspect of, you know, women not feeling super comfortable in the gym compared to men. Like it's a very male dominated environment. Um, so if women don't feel like that's a space where they, you know, they feel included or comfortable or safe, um, it's not going to favour them adhering to a, a prevention program. So um, I think that has, there's something to say about making a, an inclusive gym space for women to um, do their rehab and strength mm. and conditioning and it not to be seen as just something that is for the men. Because we know how helpful it can be for um, yeah. preventing injuries. Yeah. yeah. I didn't expect <laughs> that it was a, 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 huge, um, a huge thing, actually. Yeah, the rehab and, the, um, and all the prevention training is, yeah, it's very time-consuming and arduous and it's a lot of strength-based work. So um, having spaces that are inclusive for women are helpful to, you know, create motivation and, Um, compliance with those sorts of programs so yeah and maybe just not talking about uh, body image and about uh, when you make strength training it's for strength training not it's uh, to make a big glutes or something else so yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly super, uh, yeah what you say it's very important to to make a priority about what do you want what do you expect about this exercise we, we want girls to become um An athlete, not a good uh, things to see, and I think it makes mm -hmm. a big difference because uh, the industry of fitness, fitness industry, could be difficult <laughs> for body image. Yeah, yeah difficult definitely. but very good for self objectification <laughs> of women. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think you know a lot of women are afraid to do strength training because mm -hmm. there's still mm -hmm. you know there's still a real emphasis around beauty is small and feminine um mm -hmm. and you know having muscles is for boys so yeah. you know there's a real social stigma around that and I think that's you know I think I was chatting to Merv about this um because he does a lot of you know strength and conditioning training yeah. and um this is something that he's quite passionate about um you know in the clinic as a physio you would see a lot of women of all ages, like predominantly I'd say a lot of women in their like premenopausal years and to try and get them into the gym um, lifting weights is, it's really hard because they, you know, um, they think, you know, well, no, I want to have a nice, well, what, what they consider to be a nice feminine body and they're really afraid mm -hmm. to lift anything heavier than a couple of kilos and do high mm -hmm. reps Um You know, yeah. they're not really getting I, any sort of fatigue in their muscles, building any kind of strength that's going to yeah. have any sort of functional use. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if if it's okay for her, it's okay to to build a, a bikini body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Uh, they engage to to fix a, a body image concern. So because strength is very important, yeah. like mm. you said. Super interesting. Thank you, Kobe. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Do you want to add something about ACL? Um, no, I think we've covered quite a lot of ACL, yeah. ACL chat. Yeah. Perfect. So what do you do with Merv uh, in next month, I think? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, in April, April 22nd, um, we are running an event and it's going to be a online and live symposium um, where we're talking about gender bias within um, various aspects of research. So within pain uh, research, um, within performance and um, in sports medicine. Um, so, yeah, this this is something that we're um, we're super passionate about. Like we're really excited to present this this symposium. So we've got um, obviously Merv Travers. He'll be presenting on strength and conditioning. Um, Tasha Stanton. So she'll be she's actually going to be talking about um, gender bias within academia. Um, Claire Ardern. So she's going to be talking about other biases, gender biases within um, you know academia, sports medicine. Um, we've got Professor Sophia Nympius. Um, so she is an exercise scientist and um, she's a huge advocate for, for um, removing gender bias within um, sport. She, she's she's going to be discussing about performance and strength and conditioning. And Dr. Rachel Harris, who um, yeah. she's a, yeah, do you know her? Yep. Yeah, I see. I meet her in the WISC Congress. Oh, amazing. Yeah, super, super impressive. Yeah, so there's there's a massive um, lineup, and what's interesting about this conference is um, everyone's donating their time um, to present, and all the profits will go towards a grant that we're setting up to try and improve equity within research. Um, so yeah, I guess the whole sort of ethos around the event is where you know trying to discuss some of the the gaps within um, recruitment in in say like pain science. So we know that. Um, you know, a lot of our understanding of, of how pain works is based on male physiology. So originally it was it was done on, all the studies were done on male rodents with the, the belief that, you know, the female menstrual cycle is something that's too difficult to control for. So it's just easier if we just do, do all our testing on male rats. Um, mm. And then we have a standardised sort of, you know, participant. Um, and then we'll get an understanding of the physiology of, of how the nervous system works and then we'll apply that to male humans. Um, and then so, you know, after many, many years of research of male physiology, then the drug companies will then develop um, medications that are designed for male physiology because um, the, under, the, the belief at the time was around, you know, we don't want to mess with females' fertility, so we don't want to test drugs on women because it might interrupt their fertility. Um, we don't want to accept that risk. Um, this was after there were some really bad reactions to a, a um, an anti-nausea medication for women that were pregnant. So I can't recall the name of the medication at the moment, but it caused um, like thousands of stillbirths. Um, okay. So... So the Federal Drug Administration in the US banned women from being participants mm. within drug trials. So a lot of our understanding of, yeah, um, how pain works is on male physiology, but yet a lot of, like, there's a, there's, there are more women that have um, chronic pain conditions than men, like up to six times the amount of women have chronic pain conditions than men, and our understanding of it is based on men. The medications that we use to treat it is based on male physiology and women are having, you know, up to seven times the adverse risks to these medications than men, um, which makes total sense when you look at it in those terms. Um, so, yeah, it's only been the last sort of 10 years that there's been a push to improve equity within pain research. So have more women, with have equal numbers of men and women within um, studies and analyse those results based on the sexes, not grouping them together. Um, and I guess, you know, how that, that's just one aspect of this gender bias sort of symposium that we're looking at. We're just, we're basically telling a story of um, there have been gaps in our understanding of how things work um, that favour men um, because women have been excluded from a lot of, a lot of the research. And then how does this affect um, our patients clinically? So, you know, when, when we're treating a 50 year old menopausal women in the clinic based on research of you know almost elite male college athletes of 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah of yeah. 20 of 20 years yeah. then why would we expect that to be helpful <laughs> for, for that patient 
Like we need to be a little bit more critical, I think, of, of the research and, and also a bit more understanding that we need to shift our treatments if they're not working and look a little, yeah, as I said, look a little bit more critically at the research that we're using to drive those treatments, I guess. Um, and on top of that, we're looking to just discuss, you know, how can how can we change things moving forward? So what would those studies look like that we need to fill those gaps? Um, and what are the barriers within science as a whole and academia that are, you know, limiting us from doing those things? So Natasha Stanton is going to be talking a bit about applications for grants. Um, there's a huge disparity between men and women in their success rates for um, for getting grants to do really good research, to do RCTs and things like that. Um, but when the reviewers are blinded to the applicants, that we don't see that disparity. So there must be systemic systemic barriers within um, within place that are driving those disparities. So yeah, that's that's the whole gist of the symposium. Um, I, we're we're amazing. really mindful of it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we've been super mindful of it being an inviting um, sort of event where we want people to feel, you know, empowered by that knowledge and also hopeful. Um, we really don't want it to be a, an event where if, the, you know, if there are men that are coming that they're going to feel disempowered, like, oh, no, um, oh, I've done the wrong thing or, like, they feel like they're in trouble or something like that. Um, because I think that's a real barrier to them actually assisting in mm. um, changing this. Yes. So, yeah. so yeah, like Merv was, um, Merv was telling me a story, for example, like uh, how he, one thing that he likes to do is to increase the amount of equity on his, on the papers that he writes. So he likes to involve a wide variety of researchers of different genders within his research team. Um, and when he was a junior researcher, he proposed that idea to his senior researchers um, and didn't really hear anything back. <laughs> so I think at the time he sort of felt like, oh, well, I, um, you know, I don't really have any I did say here. I wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, yeah, have I, yeah, have I done something wrong? I, I don't belong I don't really here. have any power here to, um, yeah. to, to push this. But, you know, now he's got mm. quite a lot of power to, to yeah. shape how, how that research team looks and I think even saying that is like okay well oh I actually didn't consider that would be um, an option of increasing gender equity within research like something as simple as that okay great and uh, every, everyone can attempt yeah everyone can attend yeah so it's going to be um, online um, as well as in person so um, so we're in Perth in Australia so like it's the most isolated city in the world so Yeah, we definitely wanted people to be able to attend um, online. Um, yeah, so, yeah, 22nd of April, we're going to have a link out soon. Um, yeah. We're still sorting out some logistics around that. Um, so I can share that with you guys once that's yes. ready. Yes, perfect. Yeah, it, we will send yeah. uh, it uh, to our listeners and uh, we will uh, oh, try to, to see your event. Oh, that would be great. We'd love yeah. to have you. We're we just uh, at the beginning of the, our journey as a researcher. So it's super cool to, to uh, listen in other people who are passionate about this. So, yeah, it's super good. And uh, the idea yeah. of uh, uh, reversing funding uh, mm. for research is amazing. Super good. Mm. Impressive. Mm. Australia, you are in the future. <laughs> In France, yeah. so many things to do. <laughs> well, you guys are there, so I think you know. I think you can drive a lot of change. Yeah, it's great to hear like the work that you're doing, and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Keep fighting the good fight. We will try. We hope so. Yes, we will try. <laughs> Thank you, Kobe, for this topic. Uh, do you want to do the next questions, Barbara? It's about our special question. <laughs> Um, do you remember your first menstruation? Yeah, I do actually. Um, <laughs> so um, I was, I had just turned 11 when it happened and I hadn't actually learned what, it, what that was. Like, so at, at school, we, we learned about it two years later. 
Um, so that wasn't really useful for me at that point in time. Yes. So, yeah, when it happened to me, um, I had no idea what was going on. Um, and I was really embarrassed because, like, you know, when you're at that age, you're just embarrassed about everything. I don't know if that's just me or, like, <laughs> I think that's pretty common amongst people that are, you know, 10 to 13. You're just mortified by your body and what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really tell um, my family because um, I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what's happening here. This is so embarrassing. Um, so I went and spoke to one of my friends and was like, oh, yeah, something weird's going on. Um, and I told her what was going on and she's like, she was a little bit more mature than me, like physically. Um, and someone that sort of prided herself in being like, cause she had an older sister, she knew a lot more, you know what I mean? So she was like, oh yeah, that's, that's your period. And I was like, I don't, it, what, like, what is this? <laughs> How do I not know this? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. So I had no idea. Um, Whoa. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, my school probably needed to teach me a bit earlier or maybe my parents, but yeah, I just remember it being a really awkward time. Uh, maybe a little bit scary for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't expect it to last, um, you know, like a week. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I thought this was just going to be a one-off sort of <laughs> like five minutes one or shot. something. I had no <laughs> idea. One shot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but no. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that was my that was my experience. Do you talk a little bit with your parents or your your mother, your sister, or any any people who can yeah give you an information about this? Yeah, I talked to I talked to my mum, and she was pretty matter of fact about it. Um, as in, mostly just you know what to do when it happens. So you know the tampons or pads. Um, and, um, but not really about the biology behind it or like why it was happening, I guess. Mm. So that sort of came a bit later, um, when I actually did sex ed at mm. school. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as an exercising woman, how do you, do you live <laughs> your period? You told us that you, you were pretty experienced <laughs> in, in sports, in endurance sports. Oh. And uh, <laughs> yes. would you share with us uh, how you manage to your pain or maybe your dysmenorrhea logistical aspect of menstruation during <laughs> yeah, an yeah. Like, <laughs> is like <laughs> oh, don't want it comes <laughs> <laughs> this day please <laughs> so maybe yeah. can oh you oh my god yeah 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 well no my the first half Ironman I did I actually had my period. And oh. um, I was like, what? Like, how is this even going to work? Because, um, you know, you're out there for six hours um, mm. and there's not really, you know, that many toilets out there. So, you, like, a lot of the men will just, like, sort of stand by the side of the road if they need to pee or something like that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not – yeah, it's, it's not super um, – <laughs> helpful for yeah there's not very many sort of resources around for me to deal with that yeah. so it was it was really just I was just lucky that it was a low sort of flow day that coincided mm. with the race but yeah I was quite concerned because I was like oh no I know it like I got my period and I knew that I was probably gonna still have it when I had this um half Ironman and I was like that's gonna be a nightmare because yeah like there's no changing rooms um If I'm on the ride, I'm like the landscape is you're out in the middle of sort of like the Australian countryside, like, well, kind of like it's a small town. Um, yeah, there's not really anything you can do to sort of change like your products or anything like that. Um, but I found I don't really I found with um, the pain exercise is really helpful for me with pain. So like particularly menstrual pain. So, um, yeah, I didn't find it a barrier to doing the half Ironman. Um, surprisingly yeah so it's probably if if it had coincided with maybe a few days before my period I probably would have found it difficult to to do that level of of um you know exercise yeah <laughs> exactly yeah but during your menstruation it's more about logistical aspect which is not easy to manage than pain or intensity uh, driver 
yeah yeah I, yeah i don't know if that was helpful for anyone. do you think uh the race organization have to think differently about uh changing rooms or anything yeah i i think that would be um super helpful um because it definitely felt like it would have been a big deal for me to like exit the race and then have to you know change yeah. pads or tampons or something like that like that would have drawn a lot of attention to myself um yeah. exactly yeah um because it yeah it was a bit well, I mean it's called Iron Man so like that says how uh, gender biased it is um yeah. yeah there's there's really no consideration to it at all to be honest yeah. it's Iron um, Man. <laughs> 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 exactly yeah um but um but, Yeah, yeah. At, at the very least, might might you know make make the company think that women and men are competing in it, which they are. So, <laughs> but yeah, I guess um yeah, I this wasn't me as an athlete, but a story that relates to other female athletes. So when I was working at Cirque du Soleil, um, I noticed um so we have a gr we have a lot of people that speak many many different languages at Cirque du Soleil so there's like I think there was like 53 different nationalities on the on the show um so there were a group of artists female artists on one act that didn't speak English and they had an interpreter that would come with them um and they were quite young like they were still in their teens um just over 18 and I noticed that they um I don't think they had much of an idea about their periods or their menstrual cycle um because of the strange questions that I was receiving through the interpreter um so I started I started asking and I guess I'm a bit sensitive about this because like having had my period when I was yes, 11, 11 and having no yeah. idea what was going on I'm very passionate about like right this is your body and you just need to know how your body works because you know knowledge is power so mm -hmm. like you don't need to be embarrassed about it So I started quizzing. Uh, I have a really good relationship with the interpreter and I started having a few chats with her about their level of understanding um, and it became quite evident that they, yeah, didn't really know much about their period at all. Um, and their period, their, um, they had a lot of stress around their period, which was quite closely linked to their hymen. So they, they have a lot of, They wanted their hymen to remain intact, and that was a cultural um, belief. So, um, yeah, the, there was a, I think there was cultural pressures there to once they, I don't know, become married and then start, you know, becoming intimate with their partner. Um, if they don't bleed during the first time that happens, there was like an, mm. a, a message around um, that was quite shameful for them. So... They were quite reluctant to wear tampons and things like that because um, they were concerned that they would, you know, damage their hymen and, and then later on there'd be um, ramifications for them socially. Um, and so, yeah, I I was like, okay, right, I think we need to have a little bit of education here um, just because I, I think, you know, like 20% of people don't really have intact hymens anyway. Um, and when you're a gymnast sort of <laughs> doing this especially if you are an artist <laughs> like uh, Cirque du Soleil yeah I think there's a good chance you're going to be missing a hymen from various things um so uh, anyway yeah I was like okay well let's do I, I ran these what, what we called sex ed classes um and it was kind of funny at the time like people people at work um were like oh are you going to teach them about sex and all these things? And yeah. I was like, well, yeah, I'll, you know, I just said, look, bring all your weird questions. There's nothing too embarrassing. Um, anything you're concerned about or you've been wondering about, we're going to sit in a room for a couple of hours. You're going to learn about your menstrual cycle, your anatomy, and I can answer any of your weird questions. Um, so, yeah, we run these like <laughs> sort of period classes, we called them. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because, What I learned from them was that when they would have their period, they would actually sit out from all training for the whole week. So they thought, and they thought that that was something that they had to do. They thought their body wasn't, um, you know, it shouldn't be exercising when you're menstruating. And, you know, if you're having such 
large changes in your load. You know, you're going from doing 10 shows a week plus trainings um, every day um, yeah. to nothing for a week. Like that's a huge fluctuation in your physical activity and increases your injury risk. So, yeah, it was an interesting um, discussion that we had and I think that was helpful for them to to know that they could actually do some physical activity during that time. It's a it's a super interesting journey, and in um, in um, I don't know I don't remember the exact name of um, people who are I think it's artists, but uh, the the con consideration about body image in Cirque du Soleil is it mm. something super important? Do you see something with red syndrome? Ah, mm. uh, yeah, definitely, yeah, um, and so I worked for them for. Uh, like five years ago and so there's a lot more knowledge about red s now than what yes. there was at the time yeah. um and there's i'm a lot more i guess forthcoming with asking questions about people's menstrual cycle now than what i was at the time um because it is it's actually a very open environment at Cirque where my yeah. office was so you know if you're if you're doing a consult with a with an artist anyone can walk in Um, it's not really very private, so it's not really conducive yeah. to those sorts of conversations. Um, yeah. But in saying that, there was a few artists that would talk to me privately about um, the fact that they were, you know, losing their menstrual cycle. Um, and then other things were concerning around their body image and, um, you know, restrictive eating because I would see it on Instagram. Like they might, they might show it on Instagram, like, oh, this is how much weight I've lost or... Um, which I found to be quite alarming because they've got a lot of fans um, and that's a really unhealthy message to be um, showing their fans, I think. You know, like this is the weight that I am or like this is what I've eaten in a day when it's, you know, not a – when it's a restricted amount of food and mm. it wasn't nutritionally sound at all. Like one of the girls was doing um, – she did a diet that was – they called like an A4 diet which was essentially you want to, well, she was wanting to be as, as thin as an A4 piece of paper when she holds it up in front of her. Um, and so, yeah, it was just eating like, you know, yeah, not, not nearly enough food. Um, and, yeah, it was mostly about sort of aesthetics rather than um, the amazing things that they were actually doing on stage. I'm like, you know, like, wow, you guys are doing like incredible things, like, So many people in the world love to watch this show, love to see, yeah. like, the skills that you've got. It's so unique. And to have so much focus on, like, the way they're looking is, yeah, I find that. Yeah. I guess that's just a cultural thing, isn't it, like, within our culture. And it was, yeah, it was different between men and women because there is much more pressure on women to be looking a certain way than men. An ideal of finesse and uh, body image composition, like... You, have, you don't have to look uh, too fat or too body. It's really hard for artists, I think. And uh, the sport medicine just forget this area, I think. A lot, uh, we talk a yeah. lot about endurance sport. We talk a lot about aesthetic sport like gymnastic and um, skating figures and everything and weight category sports. But it's really yeah, a about artists yes, are and dancing and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a huge pressure, and you know a lot of the artists are quite young as well. Um, mm. They're leaving a lot of their social support because mm. they're traveling. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's I can understand mm. the pressures. Well, to a certain extent that they're feeling, um, but yeah, I think it's something. I think I would probably treat it differently now than I would than I was doing at the time. Yeah. Um, like you said, I think it's the environment probably could have been better set up to have some more personal conversations um you know around their menstrual cycle mm -hmm. around eating around body image um mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah all those sorts of things it'd be very very great to to develop this kind of uh, this kind of talk mm -hmm. i think because um, women are are not aware Uh, of the difficulties that can um, the, the consequences mm. yeah exactly especially on bone health. yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah and like yeah obviously all the medical consequences um but i think perhaps 
you know, they can be so, they, they can sort of think like, oh, well, well that's a long time in the future. Um, I'm mm. sure it won't happen to me or, you know, it's mm. hard for them to take that part seriously. But perhaps if people understood that it can impact their performance significantly, um, you know, I think, so, yeah, yeah, that could maybe be a way in perhaps. But it's sometimes it's a long way Uh, before before they can understand that their performance are impacted and sometimes it's too late to that's true yeah too late or uh, eating disorders are chronically uh, settled mm -hmm. uh, when we are waiting too much it's a bit more complicated to to get out yeah absolutely more complicated just say okay you have to eat more yeah more exactly yeah 100% mm -hmm. yeah I'll, yeah, if it was that simple, we wouldn't have any yeah. issues. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much tied into it. Exactly. Mm. I think what uh, what people mm. do uh, with uh, Reds, like uh, Louise Burke, uh, Margot Monjoy, and every people who work with this area, I think it would be more mm. easy to share with uh, professional coaches and uh, medical support team. Because yeah. uh, we have now some paper, some research to highlight. No, it's it's a problem when you don't have your menstruation. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's yeah the work that you know people have done in the last five years mm. has has really made a difference. And yeah. like it's it's much more on people's radar now than than what it was. Yeah, like five years ago. So, mm. yeah, the work that you guys are doing is amazing. Yeah. I think it's really important for. For, and I think yeah, as, making this a much easier conversation and yeah. understanding what's you know what's driving some of these um, behaviors and and how complex it is to tackle it really. And I think as a physio, uh, when you see this angle of vision, so many injury can occur because of a restriction area of uh, hitting. So I think it's it it could be a massive change in sports medicine when we will understand what is going on about uh, low energy availability and uh, what's happened to injury. Because I think some maybe ACL cheers or sometimes something can happen because you're not in your normal way of uh, cognition maybe. So it can occur so many things. So I think... Yeah, it be, totally. Be I had actually... To <laughs> Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that until this conversation just then. Um, and that makes, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, we know that fatigue impacts your, your biomechanics and, you yeah. know, lack yeah. of energy availability. You're not going to be making mm. good decisions on the field or, exactly. you know. Yeah. So I think uh, it's, more, it's more, we have to see it like big picture because it's not only about eating enough. If, if you don't eating enough chronically, And so many things can happen. And I think really because of the issue of uh, psychological faction, factors and cognition, so uh, maybe sometimes uh, an ankle sprain injuries can occur because of a red, because it's something is not good. So really, really, I think in, in 10 years, we will see so many things different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You made me think, I wonder what, I wonder what, Um, how that influences the pain system as well. Like how does yeah, how does totally. lack of energy impact? Mm. Yeah, if you, um, if how you have processing an answer, pain. <laughs> do you have an idea <laughs> about <laughs> this topic? Maybe <laughs> I don't have an idea about it just then. Um, maybe we can just do a study now. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Uh, there is something to to look at. I think so because I I was searching for uh, exercise dependence um, in the last few days and it's very <laughs> it's complicated <laughs> it's a complicated topic and there isn't any di diagnostic so in eating disorders exercise dependence is a comorbidity uh, some researchers were describing a, a higher intolerance mm. and i think it's something that i I am seeing in practice and it, it is something that I have experienced, I think, too, because I had a anorexia 
I think there is a big topic. It's a huge, uh, it's mm. a huge area of research that is not yes. investigated. I think pain, pain, yeah, uh, pain, yeah. pain research between uh, the differences in pain research between men and female is super interesting because it uh, there is a fluctuation between menstrual cycle and I think in the in the scope of a uh, health menstrual cycle there is something too uh, about how pain is changing and moving between uh, maybe one day we will make it yeah it's I hope. don't know together <laughs> <laughs> let's let's do it yeah. <laughs> That would be cool. Yeah, that would be really yeah. cool. Do you have some recommendation for people like a blog, <laughs> podcast, books, uh, which make a di which make a differences in your life or as a physio, as a female athlete? Can you share it with us? Um, yeah, Dr. Rachel Harris. She's got. I, I mean, you've probably already heard of this, but she's got an amazing um, resource on the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, yeah. female performance and health initiative yeah yeah <laughs> you're already definitely already know about yeah. that yeah so yeah perfect yeah so yeah they've they've got um a whole bunch of modules um to targeted at different um people so female athletes or healthcare providers or coaches and yeah they're amazing for looking at different aspects like how to coach um females um you know pelvic health breast health Um, all those sorts of things. I think that's really that's really helpful. Um, a couple of podcast. Oh, doc uh, Professor Sophia Nymphius. She's got a website where she's got um, quite a few lectures on there, and they're really interesting. A lot about um, female athletes and biomechanics, um, particularly around um, how um, social factors shape your biomechanics. So you know, men are or boys when you're little um you're encouraged to participate in sport like you might be given a ball as a little kid as a gift whereas girls might be given a doll or something that's a bit more passive potentially where you're not developing skills like sport specific skills from a really early age and how that impacts you know the trajectory of of men female athletes so yeah her work is, is super interesting around around those types of um things um Yeah, that would be well worth a listen. And um, there's a really cool podcast um, episode with, I think it's um, Journal of Sports Physiotherapy. Um, they did a podcast like called Insights and um, Kate Mahoney, she's a physio, an Australian physiotherapist. Um, she's amazing. She won like a Churchill Fellowship where she went around to a whole bunch of different countries and looked at um various aspects of like female um athletes and um she's a real supporter of of women in sport and now she's one of the like the managers of like this major um australian football league um women's club um so she's a real driving force for improving afl women's league um so yeah i found her really insp inspiring um Yeah, so those are the ones I'd, I'd recommend. Cool. Yeah, I can, mean, yeah. Thank you. you can right. you send, send us uh, the link of, uh, of what you, you say? You, yeah, you, yeah, 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 no will worries. It's in the notes of the episode so people yep. can, uh, can uh, reach uh, what you talk about. Super good. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Where can you follow your work? And if somebody <laughs> wants to contact you, uh, where can uh, people find you? Yeah, that's a good question. So people can uh, follow my work on Twitter. Um, that's where I would post my work to share socially. Um, people can Perfect. contact me via Twitter. Um, yeah. Perfect. We will make uh, the link uh, in, the, in the notes too. So thank you, Kobe. We would like to thank you for your time. It is our first episode in English with our French accent. So thank you <laughs> to be patient with us. Oh, your English is perfect. Oh. No, your English is perfect. Uh -huh. Thank you. Very nice. I'm not sure my, uh, my, teach, my English teacher says that, but okay, thank you. I, I get it. <laughs> And, uh, I, can, very... I can write, write them a note. Oh, perfect. Thank I'll you. write them a note and say, no, no, Manon's English is 10 out of 10. <laughs> perfect. We are very happy to share this time with you. Uh, it's a big, powerful conversation we have. 
so really thank you Kobe. We, yeah, a, a great thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we will make it in f English so you can share uh, this episode in English with your with your community and uh, your friends or everybody and we will translate it later in French with uh, our voice uh, just above yours. So it will take a little bit of time but uh, No, thank you so much for having me. It's been great talking to you both. Send us your event and we will share it uh, with uh, cool. our listeners. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Good luck for planning. See you see you in April and see you see you in April, yeah. Thank you. I'll see you in April. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Merci à toi d'avoir été jusque là. Si tu as aimé cet épisode, n'hésite pas à laisser 5 étoiles sur ton appli de podcast préféré et des commentaires bien sûr. N'hésite pas à nous dire ce que tu as aimé ou ce que tu voudrais voir améliorer. Et dans notre prochain format d'interview, si tu veux écouter quelqu'un en particulier sur le sujet de la femme sportive, n'hésite pas à nous le suggérer en commentaire ou en DM sur Instagram. Allez, à bientôt